Hello and welcome to React Native Radio, episode 32. Today on our panel, we have Mike Grabowski. Hey guys. Ali Najafizadeh. Hello guys. Jed Watson. Hey everyone. And I'm your host, Nader Dabin. So today we're going to be kind of talking about the React Native release cycle, both on the side of Facebook's team and how they actually go about releasing every couple of weeks, and also maybe about how we kind of take the release cycle into concern when we're building apps and building apps within our company. So um, Mike is kind of one of the guys that's part of the whole release cycle. So Mike, can you kind of take it from here and give us a quick overview about the general process that goes that's involved with the release cycle? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the release cycle of React Native is pretty easy. It is actually divided into two parts. Every two weeks, we cut a MRC release. And then after two weeks, we promote this release to, to stable. And during this two weeks period, we basically keep track of any issues that were introduced by this release. And then we cherry pick them optionally just to make sure everything works properly. And yeah, after these two weeks, when we are pretty sure that everything is basically all right, we as I said, promote this to, to stable release and we just publish it to NPM. At a glance, the, the, the release cycle is pretty simple because, as I said, it is divided into two steps. After the two weeks period when we have the release of the release candidate version, we basically promote it to the stable release by just publishing it to NPM. And by publishing to NPM, I not only mean just invoking the NPM publish comment, but we also have a circle CI system that's running behind the scenes that basically does all the testing and the releases automatically for us. Uh, so it's actually a cool part to investigate because when you hit, when you basically send your release to circle, there are plenty of things going on in the background. So that is exciting and not everyone knows what's actually happening in there. But as I said, it's like a lot of steps that we have to do in order to make sure everything works and that doesn't break for our uh, for our users. So I guess whenever there's a new release, does is there a certain person that kind of goes over all the documentation and kind of writes up the release docs page and kind of goes over all that stuff? Or how does that all work? Yes. Like in the past, we used to ask people for, for doing these things. Like we've been posting uh, questions on the React Native Core Contributors Facebook group, asking people to, to do them. Like like by the, back in that day, obviously everything was done entirely by Facebook at Facebook. And then I think like when we reached like 0 0.15 or 16, there was the first question posted in Facebook group. And I'm not really sure who was the first guy from non-Facebook that made the release. But after that, we have found that this is actually quite a cool way to engage people to, 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 to kind of give them the ability to give back. And we have started basically changing these people every release. When we reached like 0 0.22 or 21, I applied to do the release and it went quite smoothly. And then I just started applying for yet another release, one after another. And then after a bunch of releases, we just decided with Martin that I would say kind of kind of care of this for, for, for indefinite amount of time. So, so yeah, as I said, like when, when every new release is cut, there, there has to be an owner of this release. And the owner of the release is responsible for uh, writing up the release notes, checking out what's, uh, what's going on with the release after it's published, obviously checking out if circle CI build was green. And then during the release candidate period, which is two weeks, you have to keep track of like issues that are posted to, to the GitHub repo in order to check whether the new issues that are landing are specifically related to the release candidate problems or are React Native problems in general. And when you find some problems, you have to make sure that basically we cherry pick fixes so that when we promote this version to be a stable one, everything works. And this is quite important because when we have cut like 0 0.27, I think, when I was cutting this table, uh, the release candidate version, I basically made it in the middle of someone else's work. So it was a very, very funny situation to debug because uh, basically we had like 50% of changes to the Android code, but the rest was still in progress. So it, take, uh, it took us like, few days to realize we skipped quite a few. So it is very important to be on top of the commits 
so that we kind of make the release in the proper time. So we have this release schedule that we are trying to stick to, which is actually on our GitHub. When you go to the repo and you open up the release file, uh, there is a small table that shows the upcoming versions and the week of uh, branch cut and the approximate day uh, when the stable, stable release is going to be published to the NTM. It's really interesting to hear the way that Facebook and the React Native core team have expanded out to include members of the community in the release process. Uh, just curious, like, are there any other aspects of the development lifecycle where they've done similar things? I mean, it's, it's obviously really important to get the community involved, and this sounds like a great way of doing it. I'm just curious if, if you know of any other areas where similar techniques are being applied to sort of broaden the engagement with, uh, I guess, outside of Facebook collaborators and contributors? It's actually a very good question. I'm not really sure if there is like anything that major as releases that can be done by the community entirely. Uh, I think it might be because of the setup itself here. Uh, because obviously by doing the release, we are just meant to run a couple of comments. Uh, they're actually all located in a scripts folder. So that, for example, when we are about to publish a release, the, publi the publishing process is not actually happening on my laptop. Uh, it's happening on Circle CI, which is fully controlled by the automated scripts that were made by Facebook. So, so that, for example, when you are about to cut the release, you are supposed to run tests. And again, these tests were written by Facebook. So, so once they, they are passing, you, you just have a strict list of requirements to do. So, so the process itself is not really that complicated. And thanks to the Circle CI setup, it's not really like that important that it's not being done by Facebook because they still have full control over that. Like, like the only way for the release to be shipped to NPM is to, for it to pass all the tests. So it's not like anyone can, for example, basically delete or delete this because technically speaking, we don't have like an access to, to, to the NPM um, in order to like change the versions. So, so yeah, I'm not really sure, like in answer to your question, if there is anything specific here that can be done outside of Facebook, I think the releases are probably the most major thing that are most known to be done by the community team. So has anything ever happened that's bad? Like, do you have any horror stories or any issues that ever happened like with the release that have been something that would stand out to you? <laughs> yeah, actually like, like, they seem to happen every time. <laughs> so, uh, so, so it's something we are still working on. Like, like, for example, like the most annoying issue was when, when, for example, uh, because obviously, you know, there are like, there is limited amount of uh, concurrent builds you can have on circle. So for example, let's say we have three cute builds for the master branch and there is, uh, and there is the, the, and the last build is the build of the, uh, release candidate version. And for example, the release candidate builds are quite special because every change is issuing the documentation with update. So that means uh, the website has to be pulled onto the Circle CI system, has to be changed, regenerated, and pushed back. And the issue is, if you have like two builds running at the same time, obviously the build itself takes 40 minutes. So for example, if at the, at the time of my release can date build. There is another build from master happening that triggers documentation update just before my build. Then, for example, my build can fail like after 45 minutes. So this can be sometimes annoying because you just spend like almost an hour waiting on waiting for the build to go green. But yes, we, we've been working with Facebook on improving this so that the pooling itself happens at the end. Because the issue here was, was that obviously the repositories were kind of out of date so that there was like a push rejection. So this is like, like the most, probably the most common issue to happen when you are releasing things. There are often some other bugs that were introduced by commits that were not actually noticed by, 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 by the contributors uh, before. For example, a uh, few releases ago, we had broken the bugging on uh, the bugger on Android because the C implementation was, was changing and we had to we had to wait for a couple of hours just to wait for the confirmation that we can ship partially broken release uh, to NPM and flag this issue as a known problem of the release. And, and then it got fixed like after a few days. So like the most, the most important bit is when you have to run the, the tests. 
because you're never sure whether the tests are going to pass or not. And they take quite a lot of time because we don't have like a fully automated testing process. Every time you are about to release something, we have this manual E2E tests so that you build the app, the app is built for you. And then you have to press like, like enter. And then the Android simulator is basically open for you. You have the fully working React Native app in there and just have to follow some steps. So you have to check whether the debugger is working, whether live load is working, and whether other things are working that are also part of uh, React Native. So that it takes some time. And sometimes, most annoyingly, the last feature on the list can be broken, which means you have to go through the list of all commits, try to see which one is possibly a breaking change, uh, try to revert it, uh, see if that fixes the problem. If not, then you have to consult this issue with, with someone who is in charge of releases a bit more on the Facebook side. So yeah, so these are like these are like the most common problems I would say. But obviously we are still working on this. So that like if I stop doing the releases next month for like in half a year, anytime in the future, the next person will have a better like working experience here. Uh, because all the things will be improved. One question I want to ask you is uh, how other people can actually start helping you. Like, for example, how would you get in touch with Facebook and become some sort of like a core? Because most of the open source uh, developer, they want to know how they can actually become part of the Facebook or help Facebook or some sort of like a, like, can you also tell us the story on how you become kind of like a, how did you do to become uh, a Facebook, kind of like a, a React Native core developer, which is kind of like interesting for other people as well? Yeah, well, uh, this is actually quite a funny story because we always wanted to be core contributors with Alexia, uh, who's working with me on our NPM. So you may probably already know the answer, but we always wanted to make something cool for the community. When we started working on our, on our NPM, I told Alexia that, you know, getting into the core team by just doing pull requests or issues might be a bit tricky and we can do it better so that we just thought that maybe at some point, because obviously we felt like the CLI itself was quite a, kind of missing a few features that we really wanted. So we just thought that instead of pull requesting them, we will build a separate tool that potentially can be merged in the future. And that was actually how we got invited into the core team. We had a long discussion with Martin uh, on Facebook side about possible cooperation on improving the CLI. And he invited us to the core team. And that's how it all started. Like after that, we, 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 we got the access to the group. So we were able to, you know, participate in the release process uh, or answer these questions, whether someone is up uh, for doing the release. And that's how it all started. And I would suggest like for, for, for new people, uh, the easiest way would be to help with the change blocks. Because obviously like the release itself can be divided into two parts. The first part is the publishing itself and, you know, cutting the branch, setting up all the, all the Git tags and stuff. And this has to be done by someone who is into the core group. But then again, there is the, Hard when someone has to write the changelog. And the changelog can be done by actually anyone. Uh, I've been always trying to find someone who's interested in helping me with this, just to go through the list of comments and, and kind of come up with a template uh, for with the changes. So if someone really wants to uh, get involved and has already tried uh, you know, working on issues and pull requests on documentation updates and, and on helping others on the Stack Overflow and Facebook group and wants to do something else, I would definitely say just, just reach out to me because I often have like a lot of things to do uh, with React Native, especially these change logs, and they are quite fun to do. Uh, then you can also tweet about them so we can get some followers, which is also cool. So that would be my advice. Thank you. Um, one more question since uh, we're getting uh, in this topic. Often I found uh, that Facebook basically saying that, uh, oh, oh, uh, we do actually have this feature on our side, like in-house version, and then we have it actually ported into the open source. Is there any some sort of like a? Li- I know it's kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a uh, issue to actually discuss about this type of things, but 
um, people want to, well, especially me, I want to know whether uh, they done something exciting on a React Native that they haven't actually released it to the open source community, or they planning to actually release some sort of like a interesting feature. Um, can you actually access to those uh, content or you only access to the open source uh, repository? Mm, yeah, so we as the core contributors don't have the access to the Facebook core code, which is probably because we we haven't signed any kind of NDA. Um, I feel like like the thing is, Facebook is probably super similar to any other company so that we have a lot of core uh, company-specific plugins and modules that we have built, but we haven't open sourced yet. And I think like like Facebook already implemented like open source quite a lot of things. Like like the first day when they open sourced the Android itself, it was missing quite a few features, and they were constantly backporting uh, the internal code and the internal implementations they had. After obviously all the Facebook specific code was stripped out, um, they still do have quite a few things, quite a few cool things that they that they're working on internally. Like recently, there was a discussion uh, on Facebook core contributors group about um, de- deprecating the map view because uh, the map view was pretty similar to what they have in house uh, and had some strict requirements specific to to their code. Uh, and there was another third party module that had way more that had way more features and less issues. Uh, and it was cross-platform. So there was discussion whether to deprecate it and, and basically, you know, encourage people to, to use it instead. Uh, so they still have quite a few things. Uh, but, you know, the process is that they are trying to open source, I think, as many things as possible whenever it makes sense. Uh, there is, like, there is quite a lot of work going on in the experimental folder. Uh, there is uh, There is some very, very interesting work being done on the list views in order to optimize the performance uh, uh, when it comes down to rendering like like static views with non non dimensions dimensions. So so I don't have like a proper list of what what is to be open source, uh, but it would be actually a cool idea maybe to ask someone from Facebook what what what, what cool they have in house and and what potentially they could open source when there is the interest. Okay, thanks. I have a question about the release cycle date process. So it gets released every two weeks, is that correct? Yes, uh, kind of like like we are setting up these these two weeks requirements. As for example, the stable release was meant to be done yesterday. So yeah, I'm always trying to follow this up, and it should be done in like 14 days every every two weeks. Okay. What gets put into each release? Is it basically everything that's been done on that branch that's passed all the tests? Or is there some other requirements that kind of go into what goes and what doesn't go? No, there there is nothing like there, there is nothing like requirements here. We basically cut branch on top of, of the master. So for example, today when I was doing the the next RC release, which is I think zero point twenty nine, I just basically check out a new branch from of the master. And assuming all tests are green, you start from there. In case tests are failing, you just try to find the most recent commit that works. So the the release itself is that we are basically publishing everything that's being done, uh, all the features. So we don't have like a roadmap or a list of things that have to be sent out or should be discarded or basically pushed to the next release. It's kind of assumed that as soon as the pull request is merged, the changes are ready for the release. May I ask another question? I've been working on a, um, a project called um, React Native uh, Bridge WebView. So what it does, it just basically connects the uh, WebView to uh, WebView JavaScript to actually React Native. So you can actually create a bridge and you can actually send a commands back and forth between the WebView and uh, JavaScript. And it's kind of like popular. Well, I'm not. I'm not saying that. And one of the things that I wanted to do is, I want to add the this feature, kind of like a adding a bridge to the web view uh, at the core side. So the question that I'm asking you is, should I actually, in order to actually start a conversation about whether it's a good idea to put it into the core, should I actually start with? Um, 
kind of like an issue in GitHub? Or should I actually go into the product pane and then open that one and then invite some other people and then we can start a, a discussion over there? Which one is better? Because I start seeing that a lot of people are starting um, treating uh, their uh, GitHub uh, as a stack overflow and it makes it very difficult for other people rather than just uh, filing a blog. And then that's why most of the people are actually moving all of those issues to the product pane. So if I want to add a brand new feature into the React team, uh, where should I actually start? Uh, good question. Good question. The easiest thing is if you have an access to the Facebook core contributors group, because then you can just, just ask all these things and, and, and we can keep discussing them. Uh, and this has been done, for example, with the map view as a great example. That was, that was just a question asked whether you should go with this module or with this module. I would say like product hunt is obviously a good idea for, for features and stuff like that. I'm not really sure what's the direction here because my initial answer would be to just open up an issue, which would be like um, a feature request or an idea so that we can get the conversation going. And then if someone considers this a great idea, we could go with product hands or just wait for the pull request. But on the other hand, I'm thinking that the Facebook community group itself that everyone has access to it's also a great idea for these things because we are also there, like the entire team, like the entire core team that has an access to the core contributors group is also hanging out in the community group. So whenever you are not sure whether to open up an issue or not, or if you are thinking that the product hunts might be missed by everyone, then you can probably open up a topic there, like write a post uh, saying that you have this module. There are a few things that you like about it and whether it can be considered to be merged or not in the future. There was also recently some work on the list views uh, done by Alloy. I'm not sure if I spelled his nickname properly. Um, and basically, he decided to open up an issue where he just wrote, like, I had a problem with list views, and this is how I solved it. And, and, and I, I have a suggestion that we can, that we can kind of work on this uh, by doing these steps. But it was more like an issue, actually, trying to solve a specific problem. If, for example, your like the merging of your module would be to solve some problems, uh, for example, by adding missing features, then it's fine. But on, this, but on the other hand, the, the, the Facebook community group post is also a great idea, not only to get feedback from, from, from the core contributors itself, but also from the community just to see uh, what they think about it and whether they had similar use cases or not, and whether it would be uh, good for, for Facebook to have it like out of the box. Okay, thanks. So Mike, as a, as a guy that owns his own company or that works with the company, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I know you have a company over there that does a lot of React Native consulting and you have projects in-house that use React Native. How do you go about the projects that you have in-house that you're developing either for your company itself or for your clients? And when a new... React Native release comes about. How do you guys go about integrating that? Uh, I think Jed might have a great answer to this, by the way. Uh, speaking for my company, I can only say that like, whenever a new release comes out, it actually depends on the project because in most cases, we just bump the version whenever the stable release is cut. Obviously, since I'm on, on top of the changes, uh, I always know whether there's something breaking for the app itself or not, so we can easily update. Uh, we are not actually using the upgrade command. Uh, I'm always kind of applying these changes manually uh, so that you know it always works and it's a bit more explicit about what, what has been done or not. A uh, few of our clients are also always bumping the releases to the RC just to make sure everything's fine. And then we kind of keep opening up issues in random community modules that something is breaking or not. It's a pain. Uh, but you know the RC, the RC, the RC plan. I think is a good. I think is a good solution when your app is not actually in the app store, uh, because then you can, for example, have a feature broken for for like a week or two, and it's fine for you. But when you have an app in the app store, for example, when you are meant to be doing releases like every day or every week, um, then we are always going to the stable version. Obviously, as soon as we are pretty sure it works. But I would say like the process is easy, like like compared to the other upgrades I've done in the past and other projects I've done in the past, the process of upgrading React Native to a new version 
is super smooth. Like if you think about how the process was like a year ago uh, or a year and a half ago when we had like 0.5, 0.6, it was a very, very interesting story. Interesting story. Now it is easy because the amount of breaking changes is small. It's like five or six maybe happening from time to time. And we have these code modes so you can apply them. So it's not really like a problem uh, for you. I can expect like this process to come um, to become smoother and smoother as we kind of keep reaching more and more stable uh, stage. But yeah, like I don't have anything specific in my mind so, like as an answer to this. We just we just keep bumping the version in the package JSON and see what happens. If there is anything broken, we open up pull requests to other projects and try to fix them. If everything works well, we just we just send out the new update. <laughs> it's called the bleeding edge, Mike. I think that's, that's yeah. what you're talking about. Uh, we have a we have a slightly different approach at Thinkmill. Um, so we tend to lag a little bit behind the latest release. Um, not not so much deliberately. Not look like, not like we don't think the latest release is going to be stable. Um, but you know we've got half a dozen to a dozen apps in production that we're sort of regularly pushing updates to now that are built on React Native for various clients, um, sometimes more than one for the same client. So with a team of 15 people, like when you're talking about releases every two weeks, you've got the opportunity to introduce a lot of churn in the team uh, if you try and keep up with it. Uh, so, you know, we kind of don't, like we just relax, we take it easy. And when an app needs to be updated, we update to the latest stable version of React Native. Um, there have been a number of times, including like, you know, only a couple of weeks ago when we find that the upgrade commands don't necessarily work as expected. And it's sort of more than once I've ended up just pulling an app apart and going right all the way back to the CLI with a React Native init and then, you know, kind of piecing the app back together from the React uh, component source code and stores and um, the configuration for any native packages that we've included. And that's been getting easier partly because I think we've learned how to structure our applications so that we're not sort of like, so, so that they are modular in terms of code. Like you can just put it back together again from scratch pretty easily. That also got a lot easier once we had, uh, you know, once we were able to switch over to requiring resources and the new resource bundling mechanisms, um, you're not sort of setting up the, resource packages in Xcode anymore um, for images and such. So the flip side to that is that you don't want to leave it too long. Um, you know, if you're sort of like a few months behind on a project and React Native's had six or eight updates since then, you can also find yourself in pretty hot water when it comes to upgrading. So while we try, like we don't sort of try and keep all our apps up to date every two weeks, we also try not to let them get too far behind. So, you know, a month and a half to two months is probably the longest you want to leave it. If you're, even if you're not really making changes, if you've got a stable app, you want to be keeping it up to date. Because what's going to happen is as soon as you do need to make changes to it again, not only might you want to take advantage of performance improvements or bug fixes or anything else that's happened in React Native Core since then, but you're also going to be depending on third-party packages which are going to have been upgraded in line with React Native. So like you've kind of got this complex web of your dependencies where you've got sort of native uh, native packages and then you'll have some more JavaScript heavy packages that you might be able to update without as much dependency on React Native internals. And then you've got React Native and then you've got your app and then you've got other like, I'm going to call it JavaScript only packages that you might also want to update. Like if you're using Redux or you know, anything else um, off NPM. So you kind of like, you don't want to let it get too far behind and it's, you don't really want to be on the bleeding edge either if you need the app to be stable and in a state where you can uh, sort of, I'm going to say predictably um, create a working build and ship it um, like on, on short notice if you need to with a patch or something like that. The other thing that introduces, um, I think, an interesting complexity for our app's release cycles is CodePush. So CodePush, if you haven't heard of it before, is a service by Microsoft that lets you... It's basically like Heroku for native apps, is the way I explain it to our clients. Um, you can bundle a new version of the app and push it up to the CodePush servers, and you include a native module from NPM in your React Native app, 
And that module will check the code push servers on a staging or a production release channel with a key that you put in your info um, plist and check and go, hey, is there a new version of this bundle? And if there is a new version of the bundle, it would download it and will install it. You can, you can configure the way that it will install when your app starts. Like you can do the install and restart the app when it resumes from background mode. You can prompt the user. Um, you can do it automatically. There's, there's different schemes to configure that with. And it's really cool because it means that even though the app store review process has gotten a lot better, we're now able to ship updates to our apps for bug fixes or you know timed releases if we've got a native app that's being updated alongside a web app and potentially a marketing campaign, then you can have very specific, like really granular control over pushing out new versions of your native apps the same way you would with a, you know, a, a hosted web app. Um, so that's really cool, but it introduces this complexity because your new bundle is going to run on the same native build as the last one that the user downloaded from the app store. So you end up in this scenario where you can't update, for example, a package uh, or React Native itself if it's going to change the API that internally is defined between its native code and its JavaScript API. So we actually had an issue with that a couple of weeks ago where we'd accidentally bumped up React Native FS and we'd gone too far and now the JavaScript code that was being included in the bundle by the, the code push was no longer compatible uh, with the version of the native code that had been bundled up and was, was part of the um, binary that had been shipped through the app store. So it's, it's complicated. I, I feel like I've just talked around in circles, but um, it, it's sort of this interesting balance. So you don't want to get too far behind with the versions that you're submitting to the app store uh, or the play store either, because then you also sort of lose your ability to keep things up to date with something like code push. We've ended up in this TikTok release cycle for apps that are under active development where we try and use code push to make important timely updates. So they're the ones that you're actually monitoring the rollout. And then we update the rest of the app, like doing upgrades to React Native and upgrades to packages that we're depending on sort of when it doesn't matter so that we're more likely to have an up-to-date version of all the native packages in a local, uh, like sort of in the, in the app store, in the actual compiled app that the user is running. And that way we're able to use those latest versions when we want to make a feature or a fixed release via code push. And that's been working out really well for us so far. Um, I think given that, I mean, maybe code push is sort of less and less necessary given how good the app store um like how short those times have been and how good the review process is these days. That's been a massive improvement on Apple's part over like the sort of last few months. But at the same time, um, you know, we're also in scenarios where we're pushing out native apps via MDMs where you're trying to manage a thousand sort of iPads that are in a retail environment. And that like MDMs are generally quite flaky um, and not really good for, for pushing out timely releases reliably either, or at least they're not at this stage. Um, they're also getting better, but they're just not there yet. So code push gives us a much more reliable way of managing updates to those channels, as well as you know, the process of staging releases and promoting them to production releases within our apps. So that's an interesting issue that you just talked about, having an app that's already out there that's on an, a version that's incompatible with the version that you kind of have bundled with uh, code push and put out. Did you guys have to roll that back or were you able to roll that back or did you have to wait until uh, pushing a new version to the app store? We actually learned, like, I feel like this is a really new lesson uh, that we learned the hard way. I mean, I, I can't believe I, I stuffed this up actually. Like it's ridiculous. We just had a carrot in our package dependency in package JSON. So the way we realized it was I'd been pushing builds of this app to staging from my iMac at work and it was working perfectly. And then they came out with a patch and it was like, you know, seven o'clock at night and the client got in contact and I was like, they sort of said, hey, can you just push this out urgently? And I'm sitting at home with my MacBook. And I said, yeah, I can, it was like a text tweak, right? Really simple thing. And I'm like, yeah, I can make this and I can push it out, but I don't want to push it to production. I'm going to push it to staging first just to make sure that, 
everything works correctly because I'm in a different build environment to the one that we were testing on earlier today. And that was a really good call because I pushed that build out to, to staging and it just completely failed. Like it would crash on the home screen and then revert back to the version that had been included in the IPA rather than the version that was most recent on code push. Like that's what is going on. And I went into work in the morning and I, I gave it to one of my colleagues and I said, can you just build this and put it in staging for me and we'll see if it works. And he did. And it didn't work. I'm like, what is wrong? So we had this magical build machine, which was the iMac on my desk. And it was for about sort of eight hours, the only machine that we could reliably actually build this app on. Uh, and we didn't realize until we did, like we had uh, NPM LS running and we generated shrink wrap JSONs and we put that in Kaleidoscope and we did a compare and we stepped through the differences in our installed dependencies to work out why this had failed. And it was just because the installed version of that NPM package when you delete your node modules and do a fresh NPM install had been very quietly bumped. Uh, we didn't realize that we were running on a, on a different version. And oh, that wow. was why, yeah. And like, to make it even more insidious, right, the staging release would only fail when the client tested it on their iPads. Um, so when I you know, build for debug locally and then run that on my iPad connected to my MacBook, it works perfectly because, of course, Xcode has built the latest bundle. So you need to be really strict about actually deploying with the configurator the IPA that you've created that's been released to the App Store or released via an MDM. And um, it was only by sort of getting the IPA that was running and reinstalling that we were able to replicate the to failure ourselves. So on one hand, I mean, like always have a staging environment and a production environment and never bypass the staging environment. I'm really glad we'd already learned that lesson. But on the um, second big lesson out of that was, you know, make sure that if you're doing this sort of thing, uh, it's not safe to have carrots or tildes in your package, Jason. Um, those things can get updated and you don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And I mean, realistically, the internals of a package like the contract between the native code and the JavaScript code is not part of the externally, you know, presented API of a React Native um, package. Uh, it's it's as a package author, I would have no, you know, qualms about changing that internal stuff and just shipping a patch if that was going to fix a bug. It's not really considered, I think, what Semver should be accounting for in terms of is this a a minor, major, or a patch release? So. Yeah, you've got to be really careful sort of keeping all of your versions in sync. And then, you know, like when you've got to know when you're going to upgrade your React Native, like like Mike was saying earlier, you've got to have your packages compatible with the latest version of React. And that has to be sort of like if you've got one plugin that's just not being updated correctly or introduces new breaking changes into its API as well as an update to the latest React Native version, you can end up in a situation where you need to update to account for its breaking changes, um, which can sort of be unexpected cost uh, or time in a dev process. So yeah, we, we sort of like, I, I feel like we've found a happy medium behind these, but we're still getting surprised uh, and still learning about how to work with the pace of releases and sort of what's optimum for us in terms of how often and how aggressively or, you know, what's like the longest we're comfortable leaving it between updates and then how to manage that where we're releasing more consistently with code push and not necessarily updating the, the native parts of the bundle. We kind of like having a similar issue, I guess, a couple of months ago since uh, when the guy, uh, another guy was basically uh, removed uh, one of their package, the NPM was basically breaking. The entire oh, the left pad issue. <laughs> so what we did is, I don't know if you actually, I'm kind of like a back-end and also front-end developer. So at back-end, uh, we wrote uh, Go and then um, Golang. So uh, one of the things that they introduced is kind of like a vendoring. So vendoring is uh, kind of like uh, you put all the third-party modules into your GitHub project as well. And then you push it into your GitHub. I know NPM is just a massive. But uh, like, if you actually start doing this, you end up uh, pushing uh, 200 megabytes into uh, your Git repository. But it turns out to be pretty interesting because what happened is because you're building from your uh, projects, from your um, uh, node modules that is already actually included, you never actually got into this type of issues unless you purposely upgrade 
individual projects. And then by doing that, you can easily find the problem. And the other issue is, unfortunately, in NPM, nobody is following the semantic versioning. Everyone started with the 000, and then suddenly they bump the, the major version without any... Uh, and maybe sometimes they change the patch, but they change the, the entire API. So I wish people start uh, like basically looking at the, the semantic versioning when they start uh, updating their application. Yeah, I'm an optimist for semantic versioning. I, I tend to, like if I ever see someone who's not following it, I, I try and convince them that they should rather than uh, just sort of assuming that people don't. I don't know, it's, it's interesting. I've actually found a lot of things, a lot of the packages I've been using on NPM do follow it, but maybe we just use different packages. There's a lot of them. <laughs> Yeah. I think you could you could pretty easily not ever have like two people using the same packages. Like one of the yeah. things that I found is um, I used to work with the Elm as well. And to be honest with you, Elm Package Manager is the best package manager ever. So what happened is if you actually upgrade your uh, modules, because it knows exactly what API has been changed, during the, uh, the package installations, it will compile your code. And it will exactly tell you, oh, by the way, this module and this method uh, has changed from this API to that API. Make sure you change your code before you uh, apply these changes. So you don't, you don't have any problems with Elm. Unfortunately, we can't do it in JavaScript because there is no type. But I wish we have some sort of like a a system or mechanism that basically when you do NPM install, um, it just basically double checks or some sort of like a, I guess the only way we can do it is just uh, by having a lot of tests just to make sure that everything is actually works perfectly fine. But it would be really cool that we follow some sort of like an Elm system that uh, as soon as you install a package, it will tell you whether uh, this package is actually compatible with your current source code or not. Yeah, that would be very cool. I mean, JavaScript is basically still the Wild West, um, yeah. which I guess you just need to be aware of when you're working in React Native. And it's maybe a bit of a shock to people who are used to working in a strongly typed language, um, whether that's native coding for iOS or Android coming into JavaScript. You're like, oh my gosh, there is nothing that I can trust in this entire ecosystem. I still wouldn't recommend to anyone not to use React Native um, on projects. In fact, I was pitching it to a native development team yesterday that I'd love to work with them and show them which parts React Native would be great at. Um, but yeah, I, it's, I guess you sort of take the good and the bad. Back to your point about checking in node modules into Git. Um, there's a lot of arguments for that, particularly when we're talking about production deployment, uh, unless you're going to run a private NPM mirror, which is a good idea if you're deploying things that matter um, to the web with NPM. It's sort of on the downside introduces a huge amount of churn into your Git repo. Um, if you've got hundreds of megs of node modules, um, it can make other parts of the development process worse. We actually didn't think that was important for React Native projects, um, whereas we have different ways of managing it in our node uh, apps that we deploy, mainly because, you know, one, uh, LeftPad was a massive issue, but NPM have changed quite a few of their sort of processes and procedures in response to that and made a commitment not to break the internet again uh, or to let that happen the same way. And having watched the way that fell out and the way they responded to it, I'm happy to trust them with that. So I don't sort of assume that I won't be able to install from NPM in the future if I need to. But uh, it did sort of highlight the importance of using a shrinkwrap JSON inside your React Native projects, which effectively does the same thing. It ensures that if I'm running npm install and one of my colleagues is running npm install, we are going to install exactly the same packages. And that will only change when one of us commits an update to the package JSON folder and regenerates the shrinkwrap JSON and commits that back into our version control. So we were doing that, as you should, for node projects that we were releasing. Um, but it highlighted, you know, usually we do that when we move to production um, and we leave it sort of more flexible during development. But yeah, it's, I, I, I don't know. I feel like it was a bit of a new era. I mean, we could have, we probably should have seen it coming, but uh, it's a good story and hopefully 
having heard this, no one else will make the same one. But it was really, it was the complexity of introducing code push into it as well and having all these different dependencies to manage that, that tripped us up there. Another question that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You guys were talking about uh, manually upgrading when you're doing your uh, upgrading process on the actual app. Um, so like if someone wanted to go that route as opposed to doing the React Native upgrade, what would they need to, to know about uh, like what files they need to look into to do the upgrade? Actually, I think like the most important parts you have to log into are probably the Gradle files and the Java files. Like, like, like speaking iOS wise, there is nothing that can change that much actually, which is mainly because of the way the iOS projects are built and maintained. Because in it, essentially, everything you have on iOS is just an Xcode file, Xcode project file. So. So, so, so actually, all the changes that are being done from time to time, that are breaking and the upgrade command is supposed to do them, are just the small things like add a build flag or, or stuff like that. So in order to kind of do them manually, you just have to open up the next code and apply them like by just going through the list. Of course, it might be tricky sometimes because they are not explicitly listed. Like sometimes we list them, but sometimes there are changes they're being done totally transparently. Uh, for example, on Android, uh, the Gradle files are changing often, like the tasks and the way the app is built itself are changing quite rapidly. Uh, and these are not always highlighted. Like they are highlighted as a part of new features or like fixes, but we don't like bold them or underline them so that it's easier for the people to kind of sort of go through them and, and, and do them manually. So like like if you are doing like iOS only app you can you can just kind of probably skip the upgrade command in most cases because the changes are like minors. Uh if you are having an Android project, I don't think there is a good like alternative to the upgrade command rather than just kind of copying and pasting the files. Like like in the past we had uh the, the main activity Java template that changed. Uh and that was done by the upgrade command. And obviously the you know the reason for not doing the upgrade itself is that these changes are not breaking in most cases. Like when we changed the main activity template, the previous template was still working. It was totally fine. Uh, it's just we made an abstraction on top of that to make it easier to avoid these things in the future. So what React team is trying to do now is we are trying to make the amount of these template changes as small as possible. And that was, for example, the motivation for doing the for changing the main activity template, so that now you just extend the 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 other file that is bundled with React, so that if we are ever about to change something, we can just change the core files, so that the code you have in repo is still the same, and there is nothing extra you have to do. Like speaking for myself, I'm not using the upgrade command that much, mainly because I'm using car pods, and what I have noticed, for example, and if you are using Kakapods, you should probably pay extra attention to it as well, is that the upgrade command likes to strip the uh, the flags that Kakapods is adding. So that, for example, uh, like like in the projects I'm usually working on, we have a technical client uh, on his side, and he's sometimes doing the upgrades for himself. And I remember he messaged me like, like the day after that the app is totally like unusable because he can't even run it after upgrading. I just checked the diff, and it turned out that the flag that was added by Kakapods in order to compile dependencies was stripped out. So, so always pay attention to the diff. You can try doing it manually, uh, but we are working on the upgrade command as well. So I would say, like, if you are not a power user or a heavy user, you can just use it. There is nothing bad in using it. Uh, you can just do manual steps in case you are curious, like, what changed, or in order to properly understand, like, how it really works. But there is like no extra benefit on doing that rather than just extra time you have to spend on it. I think to answer uh, from our side, it's uh, slightly different because uh, where we're coming from, this is more if it fails or if it doesn't work. Or sometimes, honestly, if we just get our Xcode project all tied up in knots and like it's not working and we have hit the limits of debugging, um, it's sort of like at one point you go, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna rebuild the project and see what you know, like 
see if it starts working. And sometimes we found that we've ended up with, if you've been carrying forward an Xcode project config since, you know, React Native version 8, for example, um, you know, sometimes there is just stuff in there. Or if someone's installed a native package and configured it and then it's been taken out and the configuration remains and, and things like that, like the, you can, can kind of get in a mess. Uh, on the upside, it's actually really, really easy, particularly with um, like with all the, the CLI tools that you've got for automatically configuring stuff when you install plugins these days. It's, it's really fast. You basically, by React Native init running, you get the latest, cleanest version of what your project should look like. Um, and then you can just pull in your JavaScript code, which we sort of keep in an isolated directory change the file that actually binds it and causes React Native to launch the app. And you're done aside from, um, you know, setting up your icons and your splash screen and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's we, we found it to be actually a really quick way of, if we think there's something going wrong that's not necessarily related to code that we've been writing, uh, we can just kind of reboot the project and, and see if that resolves the issue. And if it does, then you can diff them, like Mike mentioned, and just see what changed and understand how you actually got yourself into that situation and what to do next time. It's been a really interesting learning tool doing that as well. Like when, when the project structure that React Native expects has changed, for example, uh, and we didn't pick up on that, you know, it's really obvious once you've run a new React Native init what it should have looked like. And, you know, you can then sort of see what you needed to do that you weren't aware of from the updates. Yeah, so like there was discussion actually recently uh, how to make this process better. Uh, there was an idea I like to abstract away all these uh, platform specific files, like to abstract away the Xcode project itself and the Android file, Android files itself, so that you don't even have to do it. Like you don't have to run any upgrade comments. Uh, all you have to do is to just set up your JS files and run React Native run. Uh, for you, a React Native bundle, and you will get like the App Store build compiled for you. This is currently stuck because we are still trying to promote bug across the community. The cool thing about bug is the bug can basically build your app without the Xcode project or without the Gradle files. Uh, you can just kind of set up a small config and sell bug to build specific Java files and specific libraries, and then bug has a cool feature to generate these files for you. So that, for example, if you find yourself in a need of Xcode project in the future, you can just run back, generate Xcode project or a similar command uh, in order to get it. So as I said, like we don't have any clear direction at this stage how to proceed further because people were kind of terrified of losing control of these files. But it's something we are still like trying to investigate. Uh, so if you have any ideas how to make this better, uh, there is an open issue in GitHub repo. You can participate in, show your thoughts and ideas so that this process gets better and better for the future and it's more like easy for new people without any native experience uh, to use React Native. That sounds really cool. I mean, it would be great to lower the barrier to entry there. Um, I think that for most of our projects, without having looked at it, I'd imagine that we, we really appreciate having control over the Xcode project for things if we're dropping in a service like Open Airship or if we're writing our own native code as part of it. Um, having access I, it'd be interesting to see how many apps you could get away with not having control over the xcode yeah. project for uh, but yeah certainly for getting started and the fact that there's that upgrade path it sounds kind of fantastic we should definitely drop a link to that in the show notes i think that would be really good oh yeah i'll try i'll try to find it yeah like like you know definitely these things are keep getting improved like for example with upcoming release i think like if i'm not wrong uh, there was a pull request recently that we merged that basically removes the uh, removes need for specifying the um, the the IP address of the packager so that the IP address and the packager port are detected automatically for you so that you can finally forget about changing localhost to the IP address and then accidentally committing that repo and get it, <laughs> and, and you know then getting friends like. Why did you put like random IP address in the repo? So, oh, man. Um, so many, yeah. so many files that I roll back before I do a git commit in my React Native projects. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, there's always one every couple of weeks that slips through. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Look forward to hearing more about that.
All right, guys. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and jump to our picks. So, Ali, do you have a pick tonight? Well, I guess I'm going to go with my project, uh, React Native uh, Share Extension. You stole my pick. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a good start for people to take a look at the Share Extension as well because uh, we have a lot of problem with the uh, uh, Share Extension and then we wanted to... Uh, Attach this like uh, developing the React Native with the share extension, and the cool side is you can connect the uh, code push with the share extension as well and update it as well if you really want to. Jed, do you have any picks tonight? Yeah, I've got two. Um, I mean, obviously, code push. Given that I spent a lot of time talking about it, is one of them. It's completely changed how we feel about releasing apps, even. You know, when you can get one into the app store in a few days now, it's still very different to the feeling of pushing out an update to a website um, or a server and the fact that you control that down to the minute and can watch it roll out. So Code Push has been revolutionary for us um, and it's fantastic. I, I thoroughly recommend checking it out. Uh, my other pick is actually not, it's more for React than React Native. Um, so Cloudflare not too long ago released their Cloudflare user interface toolkit, uh, CFUI. So they actually moved from Backbone to React. And James Kyle, uh, I, sorry, I apologize to the team there if there were other people who were a big part of that, but uh, James is the one that I spoke to about it. And he was the lead dev on that project. And it's not only a really good re uh, sort of reference set of user interface components, but it's really interesting the way he set up the build process around it. So they've used a tool called Learner that he's also maintaining uh, and that Sebastian McKenzie was, was a big part of the build for um, around Babel. Um, and Learner is a way to basically have a mono repo that builds to lots of different NPM packages. And it, it's a very easy way to manage and build a large project like this that's broken down into lots of small NPM packages. So even if you're not interested in using Cloudflare's UI library in your project, I'd strongly recommend checking it out from a component structuring and project structuring perspective. There's a great blog post on it that we'll link to in the show notes. Very cool. Mike, do you have any picks? Yeah, I actually have two as well. The first one is actually the React Native SVG package for uh, for basically, you know, kind of writing vector graphics inside your React Native apps. Um, I've been actually working on these things for like past two weeks in order to write a lot of like circle spinners and stuff that uh, that I was basically given. And I would suggest it strongly, I, I would strongly recommend it to anyone who wants to write a robust vector graphics and kind of animate them, uh, but don't want to learn like another paradigm. When you are familiar with the SVG that you know from web, uh, this module is great because you can port like almost all the features and they work pretty well. So definitely go and check it out. Uh, and the last big is actually uh, going to be about the next release, uh, which is going to feature the RMPM link. Uh, so this is like the first part of our merging plan. And as, I, as we were announcing in Paris, uh, in this release, you won't have to install the RMPM itself anymore uh, just because the link itself, the most popular common, is now bundled. We are working on bundling the RMPM itself, uh, but for now, if you just want to use Link, you can just React Native Link, and you will get all the same features. Uh, so big thanks to Martin and Alexio for kind of hacking this up with me in Paris. It's been a great time, and, and, and I'm so excited to finally see this kind of basically landing in React Native. Great. Cool. Very cool. Okay, so I have a few picks tonight. My first one is going to be Zootopia. If you haven't seen Zootopia, I suggest going to check it out. It just came out on uh, DVD. And, and if you have Apple TV or if you have Amazon Fire, any of that stuff, it's all it's all available there. Um, so Zootopia is like a Disney film, and it's really good. Um, I have kids, but I'm also a big animated Disney film guy. So um, it's one of my favorite movies I've ever seen, actually. Um, my second pick is going to be a uh, group of blog posts I'm putting together on the React Native Navigator Exper Experimental. Um, it's on uh, my Medium page. So I have uh, three parts so far, and I'm hoping to be putting out a couple of more parts. So it's kind of in a, it's kind of a deep dive into the new API for React Native Navigator Experimental. 
Um, the API is changing um, very quickly, actually, at this point. So I'm going to be updating it as the API changes. But so far, um, I'm kind of using it as a way to learn it myself and um, take whatever I've learned and kind of put it down into a set of blog posts so other people can go back and read it as well. Okay, well, that wraps up episode 32 of React Native Radio. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next week. 